Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review, who is also the co-author of Heavy Lifting. I'm Greg Corumbus. We have three martinis for you today. Really bad, really bad, and crazy. And, uh, Jim, let's start with the first really bad one. This is courtesy of ABC News and their investigative reporter, Brian Ross. He has been looking into the background check into Tashfeen Malik. She, of course, is the one from Pakistan who... Met her husband, Syed Farouk, in Saudi Arabia. He brought her here last year. They're the ones that committed the San Bernardino terrorist attack. And it turns out we've got even more disturbing information about the background check, or lack thereof, that goes into accepting people from other countries. Just last week, we heard about uh, the, the program that the DHS scrapped that potentially could have help stop this because they're investigating a group that this couple was affiliated with. Now Brian Ross unleashes this bombshell. And now ABC News has learned that a secret U.S. policy prevented immigration investigators last year from looking for Tashfeen Malik's extensive social media messages that the FBI says included talk of jihad and martyrdom. Immigration officials uh, were not allowed to use uh, or view social media as a part of the screening process. A former Homeland Security senior official, John Colton, says immigration officials asked Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson for new policies last year to allow them to look at applicants' social media public posts, but were opposed by the department's Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. The primary concern was that it would be viewed negatively uh, if it was disclosed publicly. Malik received her fiancé visa last year in just three weeks, with no check done for whether she had any online messages in support of terrorism. In a statement to ABC News this morning, the Department of Homeland Security says it has now started three pilot programs to search the social media visa applicants, but, but insiders this morning say it's still not a widespread policy and a major impediment. Jim, those of us on the right have been saying for a while now that political correctness can kill. This is a specific example of it. Public social media statements are somehow off limits because how dare we offend someone by looking into what they shared with the rest of the world. Greg, please tell me that this morning somebody in Jay Johnson's staff was, boy, good thing we avoided that bad publicity, huh? (laughs) Nice call, boss. The other point I'm going to make, Greg, is that, look, if there's anything you or I could find in a Google search... I really think DHS should be able to have that, (laughs) right? Yes. This isn't hacking into her email. This isn't going into anything that's not, you know, this is social media. This is putting it up for the world. If they couldn't catch this person, you have to wonder, you know, is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, saying, hmm, maybe I could sneak into America with this. (laughs) Um, It's it's really appalling. And, of course, this all comes just weeks after Obama assured us that all the Syrian refugees would have nothing but the most stringent and most thorough background checks by the Department of Homeland Security's counterterrorism screening. So um, weren't those Republicans crazy for overreacting? Ah, oh, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's thoroughly like, like we had two um, emotional blows when we get hit by terrorism. The first is the actual crime, the actual wrongdoing, the actual assault on innocent people. But the second one was seeing all the red flags that were missed. And maybe that some of these things are, are 2020 hindsight. But in this case, this really seems very glaring that this is your know, three separate checks of this woman and nothing actually, they didn't find any of this stuff that was literally out there in the open on social media. No, it's incredible. It's one thing, and it would be a glaring oversight if they just never added that to the protocol. But to be specifically asked, mm. can we do this? And to be denied, it goes back to the old Kathleen Sebelius question for Jay Johnson now. What does it take to get fired in this administration? Oh, I'm sure that uh, Eric Shinseki could probably give some answers on that <laughs> or Archuleta over at the Office of Personnel. I mean, there's just so many options there. Uh, but you, you make a very good point, Greg. In a normal set of circumstances, no one's asking him to literally fall on his sword. Just observe that you failed on this. And at the very least, let's see an enormous amount of effort at DHS to tighten this up. At, at this point, you know, everything about, you know, pausing the refugee program, uh, pausing really all immigration, all of a sudden looks a lot more sensible when we see how clearly and catastrophically the system failed in this case. All right, on to the second bad martini, and you'll all be relieved to know that at the last possible moment for the world to be saved by our wonderful political leaders around the world, it really was the last chance, that's what President (laughs) Obama said, they stepped up and they agreed to the final draft climate agreement in Paris on Saturday, the president even making a public statement over the weekend about how wonderful it is that uh, all of this was accomplished. 
Well, looking at the uh, the details, it looks like we're supposed to be down to basically zeroing out our carbon emissions by 2050 and certainly by 2070. And uh, apparently the rest of the world is supposed to make concessions as well. But there's an interesting twist here. Uh, here's Chris Wallace talking with Secretary of State John Kerry on Fox News Sunday yesterday. First, we're just going to play the question from Chris Wallace. But is there anything binding, sir, that uh, would force uh, a country like China, which is the world's biggest polluter, to make specific reductions in carbon emissions? Jim, you and I and most rational people would assume there are two possible answers to that question. Yes and no. <laughs> here's, what, here's John Kerry's answer. The answer is, by virtue of the transparency mechanism, which is broad-based here, President Obama was determined to try to get an agreement move the world in the right direction. And the president has taken enormous initiative in order to move us to engage with other countries, including China, and bring them to the table. Some countries, Chris, simply wouldn't accept a mandatory mechanism, we among them. So the best we can do in an effort to try to begin to change people's thinking is to do this mandatory reporting requirement. And the mandatory reporting requirement has to be updated every five years. And every five years, it is mandatory that countries retool their reduction levels in order to meet the demands of meeting the curve of reduction to which they have committed. So that is a serious form of uh, enforcement, if you will, of compliance. Uh, but it is no penalty for it, obviously. But if there had been a penalty, we wouldn't have been able to get an agreement. Ah, there it is. If there had mm. been a penalty, we wouldn't have an agreement. That's a really long way of saying no. <laughs> uh, so, and to add a pile on to the bad news, of course, so we've got our administration on climate change who's ready to enforce this. Other countries probably won't. And, of course, Congress, as of right now, gets no say. Hey, uh, Greg, is this a treaty? Apparently not in the eyes of the administration and the rest of the world. That Nothing's a treaty be. anymore, right? You know, you just sign anything willy-nilly in agreement with Ford. But it's totally not a treaty, you know. Uh, you have to obey it, but it never has to come up to the Senate for, for a vote, apparently. Um, I want to thank you for what I think is the longest uh, sound clip we've ever played on the Three Martini Lunch, Greg, uh, of John Kerry. This kind of going on forever. And basically, you know, he could have done it with no or it could have been, look, Greg, we're going to have a report every five years. Every five years, they have to tell us what they're doing, and thus bad things will stop happening. You know, um, I guess the idea is it's public shaming, right? The, uh, the you know of China, which you know, I mean, the perpetrators of Tiananmen Square, ludicrous human rights abuses, abu police state uh, uh, hacking all around the world. But we're going to shame them into into carbon <laughs> reductions, or else they won't get the good China at the next state at the next state dinner at the White House. So there you go. Oh, yeah. And of course, those mandatory reporting requirements, I'm sure there's penalties for not actually reporting those, right? No, there's no penalties. <laughs> so it's kind of like those unarmed cops in Britain. Stop. <laughs> or we'll say stop again. Oh, man. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how this be a crazy martini, Greg. Because, you know, <laughs> wait, that wasn't the crazy one? <laughs> That's right. All right. Let's move to crazy. Uh, speaking of Chris Wallace, uh, in addition to John Kerry, he also had... Donald Trump on his program on Sunday, and they talked about a lot of things, a lot of the conversation, of course, about Trump's uh, call for a temporary ban on Muslim immigration. But then he also mentioned that Ted Cruz, who has had a gloves off approach to Donald Trump throughout this campaign in hopes of picking up his supporters because he assumes Trump is going to fade at some point, apparently at a, a, a fundraiser, somebody recorded at a private fundraiser, Cruz saying that the thinking is that ultimately people will lose faith in the judgment of Trump and Carson, and that is Cruz's path to the nomination. So Chris Wallace asked Trump what he thought about Ted Cruz. I don't think he's qualified to be president. Why not? Because I don't think he has the right temperament. I don't think he's got the right judgment. What, what's wrong with this temperament? Well, you look at the way he's dealt with the Senate, where he goes in there like a you know, frankly, like a little bit of a maniac. You're, not, you're never going to get things done that way. Look, <coughs> I built a phenomenal business. I'm worth many, many billions of dollars. I have some of the greatest assets anywhere in the world. You can't walk into the Senate and scream and call people liars and not be able to cajole and get along with people. He'll never get anything done, and that's the problem with Ted. Jim, there's obviously a lot of people in the Senate, Mitch McConnell among them, who would uh, appreciate that characterization of Ted Cruz, perhaps. But uh, for Donald Trump to be the guy that says you have an, uh, a, a temperament that's potentially out of control and you call people names is not necessarily the most distinguishing characteristic. For him. 
two thoughts. So first of all, uh, Greg, so we're, we're, we're now the conservative stance, right? What, what conservatives want is for you to go to Washington and get along with Mitch McConnell, <laughs> right? That, you know, go, none, of this, none of this yelling, none of this disagreeing with this stuff. You know, the important thing is to respect the collegiality of, of the Senate, the decorum of the Senate. You don't want to shut down the government over, over stuff like this, right? Can, can, can I just get a scorecard of what counts as conservative this week? Because it just changes really, really quickly. Uh, and the other thing is, is that I don't know about you, Greg, but when I need somebody who can go along with Washington and bring everyone together, uh, treat everyone with respect, make everyone feel like they're part of the process. I think of Donald Trump, who last week said that uh, he could, by executive order, decree the death penalty for all cop killers. I mean, he might unify everybody against him. OK, you know, but uh, yeah. So There was one interview. I don't know for sure if it was the Wallace one where somebody said uh, in reaction to what he said about Ted Cruz. Well, haven't you called everyone in our government losers? And he said, I never said they were losers. I said they were stupid. <laughs> so it's a fine distinction there, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but anyway, stupid winner, you know, which. Actually, maybe that uh, that summarizes some people we know. But anyway, here's the here's the uh, interesting twist, though, because uh, in addition to uh, Trump's reaction to why Cruz should not be president, we all understand the game Cruz is playing here because there's a big chunk of the Republican electorate who is very devoted to Donald Trump, and uh, Cruz figures that he's going to need some of them, and so he's been very nice to Donald Trump. So he tweeted out uh, the link to the Michael Cimbello song "Maniac" in response to that comment, and uh, one earlier, I think this one was on Friday, he says. The establishment's only hope, Trump and me in a cage match. Sorry to disappoint. At real Donald Trump is terrific. Hashtag deal with it. So, Jim, it's, it's getting a little weird because it's one thing to just wait for the other guy to screw up, but it's another thing to tell everybody how awesome the guy who's winning most of the states and, and the national polls is. Um, I, I, it's very hard to keep up with Trump. Uh, he typically had a very busy weekend. Uh, in addition to the, these criticisms we've laid out of his criticisms of Cruz, uh, you did see also that he, he ripped into Cruz for opposing ethanol yes. in Iowa. Now, obviously, look, this obviously very popular in Iowa. He said that the other thing is he said he didn't. The reason Ted Cruz opposed ethanol is because he's from Texas and there are a lot of oil companies in Texas. <laughs> now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, yeah, Ted Cruz would really like to see a thriving oil industry for his home state, but also because, like, hey, it's good to have a good thriving oil industry. Um, but, but the other thing is that, you know, so is that it, we conservatives are now pro ethanol again, right? We, we now totally want state intervention and mandates to take corn and put it in our gas tanks. Is that, is that that's the conservative position now? Great, wonderful. Yeah, so that's where we are. Um, there we are. Yeah, so, you know, we, we can just kind of just, at what point do we name it? Um, the bad martini is named after Harry Reid, right? Sure. All right. You know, maybe maybe Trump is in good good stand, good of getting the, the Donald Trump honorary crazy martini uh, from here on out. We'll see. Wow, Jim. Uh, good start to the week. Talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and tune in again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.